So I'm gonna cover a topic that seems to be dead, but uh, we're, we're like you know, energy sector. There really no, there's not a whole lot of drilling going on. But if you talk to a bunch of asphalt guys, it's a matter of time. It's so what's funny is what happens in you know natural law things. Everything that goes up must come down, but in the energy sector, everything goes up again. And so that's what kind of kind of we'll be talking about today. Uh, this is kind of the general outline. I think the Austin district is probably the least known energy sector district in the whole state. And everybody asks me, yeah, oil wells in Austin? Like, yeah, we have oil wells in Austin. And so we're going to talk a little bit on how we've tried to characterize some of that development to try to get ahead of the game when it comes to uh, preventative maintenance and rehab. So what we did, what we developed was an energy sector traffic model. It's basically an early, early warning system. Uh, the intent is basically to detect any changes in land use patterns or basically oil uh, development uh, to predict truck traffic increases during construction and post-construction. Uh, the original idea I came up with this is I knew uh, Dr. McCullough at CTR was developing these type of models for urbanization for our, uh, for our, uh, for our CAMPO or MPO. And I thought we could probably use the same logic, you know, doing it for oil sector development also. So it's basically what this model does. It helps us identify state routes for future development. Uh, they're going to be utilizing these roadways for energy sector roads, uh, estimate the number of trucks, and then determine what the best way to do uh, preventive maintenance and rehab for those roadways. So what do we know? We, we, now that we've kind of, we're kind of the post-drilling era right now, we know exactly, everybody knows what fracking is, how it's done, all the processes, all the, the amount of trucks, and, and all the work it takes into making a fracking well. We also know basically the gross weight ve uh, vehicle weights of all these trucks, and we know uh, a whole lot of what those those uh, those loads and different equipment that these trucks have to load and what they weigh. But we also know that since we know those trucks and their the wheel configurations, we know the easels basically that it adds to to a roadway, which is basically uh, equivalent uh, single axle loads that we use for for pavement design or characterizing the loads of a, of a different truck. Mm -hmm. So we know all that, but what we don't know is where they're going. <laughs> Most of the time we were like, well, we know we have, a, we have a, a well being developed out here, but we don't know where the material is coming from, where those equipment are coming from, but we know we have a well. We just don't know where those trucks are going. And so what we're trying to do with this, with this traffic model is basically use assignment traffic modeling. Uh, when I was first introduced to uh, assignment traffic modeling by Dr. McCullough, uh, I was, he was trying to tell me how this system basically assigns the most, the most predictable path for that truck. It was ironically the weekend before that I watched the, the, the movie uh, Battleship. Has anybody watched the movie Battleship? Okay. Well, you haven't, you get to watch the little movie for, for about a minute. Oops. Hopefully it works. Never mind, no movie today. <laughs> basically, in that movie, it built a big grid pattern to predict the movement of these alien ships. And that's kind of what we're doing with this, with, with, uh, this model, is we're building a grid network using permits, whether past or new ones, using, uh, that we can get from TCEQ or Railroad Commission or any of our, our uh, internal databases to know exactly where material sources are, where the oil wells are, the, the, the water wells, and the water disposal wells. And with that grid network, we can, and uh, the traffic uh, generation models that we have, we know exactly or we can guess where their predicted routes are. This is what the Austin District looks like. Here's all the oil wells, water wells, and water disposal sites, and all the, the uh, sand uh, quarries that, that are in our region or our adjacent districts. We approximately have you know, 514 water wells, 84 quarries, 317 water wells, and 600 uh, oil permits uh, in, in our area. So here's a roadmap to, the, to, the, to this model. So now we have all these databases, we all this, have this, all this great information, so basically we integrated all that information. And what, it, the, what the program does first, uh, it takes each company that owns that well and owns that water well and owns that disposal site and predicts the, the shortest path constrained to the, to the state system to get an origin and destination. And it does that for every 
uh, owner of each permit. Then it assigns, knowing that knowing the uh, truck trip generation, a load for each of those uh, trucks for each of those different functions. It eliminates uh, non-critical paths, basically county roads and stuff like that, because we're the state system, we're, we're concerned we're gonna push those trucks to our, our system. And then it identifies roadways that kind of peak out, like, okay, this is, this is accumulating a lot of easels, and this is gonna put, push these roads up to the top. The final output basically is two different ways. It comes in a tabular form, so basically, this is a listing of roadways. It shows a roadway, the, the beginning and end of it, how many miles is, what county is, and what the cumulative easel is. This is for a three-month run. So we, we do this every three months to see what's jumping up on the radar on a west roadway. This is the visual depiction of that. This is for basically the operation of a few different companies. These are all the quarries over here, all the sand. It comes over here. Most of the oil wells are in, in uh, Lee County and or Northern Bastrop. Ironically, most of the water disposal sites are over here at Caldwell. So they're jetting across uh, this part of our district. You can take an isolated uh, look at one company and see how they're utilizing our roadways. So there are three different operations, uh, if I remember correctly. This is, uh, the green is coming from the quarry. The black is going from all, all the water, and then green is from water disposal. And so cumulatively, cumulatively, for that three months, this one company applied these many easels to these roadways. So we also can look at a corridor, and I'll be talking about State Highway 21, you know, a roadway very familiar to all you Aggies. Like when Greg Melodic was in our district engineer, he's like, the, the road to Mecca is clear. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, with all that, we have basically 24 wells along this roadway associated with this roadway. And we can basically calculate all the easels from the quarry to the well, well to the disposal site, the fresh water to the well, and cumulatively come up with those easels for a three month run. So what do we do with this data? Okay, well now we have all, these, all this loading and we know the roadway. We basically assess all of our, all these roadways and see what, what uh, capacity, the structural capacity we have at, at the time. And then we can predict now with all these additional easels what the future easels will look like. And what that'll tell us is basically whether that roadway is going to be structurally sufficient for the future. And, and uh, depending on what this ratio looks like, we'll do different levels of a, of a, a different approach to each one. Anything 70 or greater will probably do some type of uh, preventative maintenance or light rehab. But anything less than 70 we'll, we'll have to address through uh, moderate or heavy rehab. So here's a little here's a little process we go through. So if it's if it, we, we first ask ourselves, are we structurally deficient? And we are. We have to start thinking about these two routes. First, we got our first approach in our district is we widen our road first, and it, and just take on that surge of of tra truck traffic in the initial stage. Then we come back with some type of structural uh, overlay, whether it be hot mix or a base overlay. Our, our strategy is we're going we're gonna to widen for safety, but also adds lateral support so it actually uh, enforce, reinforces the pavement. We let the trucks beat up the road for a little while, then we come back and put our overlay, our structural overlay, because we don't want to put that structural overlay for all the surge of trucks to beat up. If we're actually structurally okay, then we've got to ask about our safety. If, there, if we have some drop-off issues, then we'll just widen. So continue with our example of State Highway 21. About four or five years ago, uh, we, were, we, were, we knew that this route needed to be widened. It was basically a four-lane undivided road with, with no shoulders. Uh, we, uh, we knew that we were going to have some development in the area, so we, we uh, widened it first. And so we're right now we're in phase one. So if you go down 21 to Austin today, you'll realize we did widen the road. What you don't know is we knew that this was going to be structurally insufficient within 10 years. So in, in 10 years, we have a structural three-inch overlay scheduled for that roadway. In summary, this is how we have used this as a predictive model to know exactly where to put our, our rehab money into play, knowing that we're going to have this kind of development. 
It also gives us an early warning system where we may not know if fracking will be coming into existence if those permits allow us to have that grid out there to, to kind of predict where that development's gonna be and to assess the, the local roadways. Uh, it's a very flexible uh, tool because you can basically look at the data multiple multiple ways. Uh, all the all the data that I showed is easily accessible. It's publicly accessible, and you can you can get it and grab it pretty easily. And then uh, it's, you know you have a visually based or tabular based. You can look at the information. Uh, our next step is all those loads that you looked at were loaded trucks. We haven't accounted for the unloaded trucks, so we're going to add that in there. Uh, we're going to try to resolve how we're going to be looking at this because you have that surge of trucks at the very beginning, and then it kind of goes nominal after that. So we're gonna look at how we're gonna assess the remaining life of that pavement. Uh, we, so we had to decide what kind of damage model we're actually gonna look for in the future. And right now we're, we're developing our urban, urbanization model uh, to do the same thing. And that's it. Any questions? Yes, sir. Have y'all done anything to try to validate that, such as talking to the industry, you know, seeing what maybe their thoughts of the use are? Yeah, we we so we so we're, the question is is have we talked to industry to validate any of the so any of the future growth is what you're asking for? Yeah, I, I have a few individuals within the asphalt industry that have a pretty good pulse on on the old futures and they're still buying equipment, they're still buying capital. I'm referring to the selection of roadways. Oh, now y'all got a lot denser uh, roadways than we do out in West Texas, but. I just wonder if you talk to industry about what roadways they prefer and typically use and see how that matches your. We, we've, we've, it's pretty predictable which roads are going to be based off of this, and it pretty much calibrates to what the actual use is. So, what you see on the model is what you're seeing with your eye on, on, the, on as far as the traffic flow. 